All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michael, Santa Monica Studios, late night Wednesday. As we record this, we're time stamping it because the Australian Open is in full effect. 2024 edition, a couple days in, a lot of drama, a lot of excitement. Two podcasts each week, that's how you know it's a big deal. And bringing back my expert, Barstool Sports' Barstool Hubs, Eric Hubs on the show. Uh, third time on the show, but this is the first time we've actually done it during a major. So we'll just let the takes and observations fly, but excited to talk tennis with you again. Yeah. Uh, listen, you're in California, so <laughs> it's it's six o'clock right now. <laughs> it's nine for me, that, and that's fine now. But once it's like two, three in the morning, you have it so easy at that point where it's like, I have to decide if I want to ruin my next day at that point. Is this match good enough right now? To ruin tomorrow. That's that's what I have to decide every night. It's a little easier tonight because my fiance, who's a night nurse, is not here. So I've got the whole apartment to myself. I can make as much noise as I want. I can have the TV loud. I'm free. Oh, yeah. But like some other nights, not so much. She's got to sleep all this. So, you know, I'm in a conundrum here. I love this tournament so much because I am a night owl at heart. I'm a, you know, I, I, I just don't sleep. I, I didn't even know melatonin was a thing until two years ago. So, like, I had no, now I do. So, I can knock out of any time I want. But I used to just be up. Like, at all, yeah. it would just be, I'm just going to watch the Australian Open because I have nothing else to do right now. So, uh, no, but this this is one of my favorite tournaments of the year. Obviously, it's a Grand Slam. Uh, the first slam of the year after the month break that they get, which should definitely be longer. And that is definitely a discussion that is ongoing. Uh, but, yeah, I dude, I'm fired up. Yeah, I was going to ask you, too, just as an aside to that. And I used to, you know, I was Eastern in Central time zone. Are you at a point where you're maybe getting up early to see maybe if a match is still going on? Because I do remember one year, I think it was, and I've told this before, but Stan beat Djokovic the year he won his first, his only Australian Open. And I was in the Central time zone. I woke up at like 7, 6.30 a.m., 7 Central time. And I'm like, this match is still going on. So there are well, times, I think, when you're on that time zone where you might get up a little early. The match that I remember of recent memory is um, when – who was it? Who be, was it? Nadal, Nadal Medvedev? Nadal, yeah. Nadal Medvedev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I stayed up. And, and the, like, to see everyone I follow on Twitter wake up – I think it was a weekend or something. It was a championship. Of course it was. Yeah, it was the weekend. Yeah. Um, to see them all wake up and be, and then start, like, you know – what is this match still going on? Like, they don't even watch tennis and they're watching. I'm like, yo, I've been here for six hours. Like, Medvedev had this in the bag two hours ago and we're still, we're still going here. Um, but yeah, no, that happened the other day. Um, what was the long match? Uh, I, Felix team? Was it that one? Yeah, that sounds right. I yeah. think I live bet uh, team lost that. So I just woke up and immediately lost money. That was fun. Um, there was a few other ones. Yeah, there, there's, there was one day for whatever reason maybe oh it was there was like a million five setters in one day uh, so that's what yeah. everything but yeah those are fun wake-ups when you just They're like there. how is this possibly still going oh on? that happened last year murray and kakanakis yeah. i woke up like early on the west coast and it was still going on so mm -hmm. i only imagine um and i do think i want to say for the formal introductions you've kind of been the one to introduce your cohorts and your friends to tennis it just seems like every year you got to go to the u.s open the group and it's got to be the hubs group it keeps getting bigger and you keep introducing more people to the sport i love it and i've yet to find someone that has like really bought in to like okay let's like let's follow this a little bit and they're they just are hooked mm -hmm. um i'm not gonna say i did that to dave portnoy uh he kind of found his way in with sabalenka obviously and, you know, perfect. and and his gambling um uh, you know habits but um yeah no like i i took uh fights and nate uh, two years ago, and we happened to see the best match of the whole tournament uh, with Carlos and Sinner just going nuclear. Uh, and they were, uh, if you didn't, you don't even have to like tennis at all, and you would have enjoyed that. So uh, that was kind of like cheating. Uh, like, I was like playing with steroids a little bit there. But yeah, uh, I, I slowly but surely get more and more people in every single year, and it's beautiful to see. And honestly, you don't have to like, like just go to the U.S. Open on the Friday of Labor Day weekend. You will have a blast. It is my favorite day of the year. Like, like pretty much, yeah. yeah, hands down, favorite day of the year. I never have a bad time. I, uh, I'd say the same thing. Like, just get someone who's not sure about tennis to the actual sporting event live, and they will probably be hooked. Yeah. Uh, this year's Aussie Open, a lot to discuss. I guess we can start at the top down. You know, Novak Djokovic hasn't looked crisp as his normal standards, has lost a set in each of his first two matches. Was up against against Popper, who could have won the third set and gone up 2-1. But, you know, there's... 
there's talk of whether hubs he's battling an illness which he said he's felt a little sore all this stuff but again i come back to you know they poked the barrel last night and uh if you're an aussie fan and you've got your guy and you're rooting for him i just don't know why history has taught us you're going to poke the bear and we see what happens he just raises his level and smothers you it's genuinely like these people have never seen this happen. Like we said, the last time I came on, he, yeah. there was something, you know, he, this happens all the time. These people don't learn. No one learns. No. No. You're better off cheering for him if you want him to lose. Like you just are. I've now reached the point where either two things are at play because these people can't be that stupid. And I know it was an Aussie play. So they want to get behind their boy. Of course, he was playing well through two mm-hmm. sets. I was like, whoa. And then obviously he almost, you know, he, he he had him on the ropes a little bit of ropes. I'll put that in quotes because yeah. it was not like, you know, to win the match, but um, two things are at play. Either one, there's Djokovic fans in the crowd who are smarter than everyone else who know, Oh, they can see when he's flat. Let's cheer him on. But I'm oh, sorry. Let's, let's egg on him. Yeah, and we yeah. know we're, you know, we'll take the bullet and then he's going to come back and that's our boy. And we're gonna basically will him the victory in our weird way. Or two, his team is not telling him they're doing this, or they're planting people in the crowd to do this. And then afterwards, like they, they get a little hat tip and they're part of, they get a little money. Novak doesn't know these people exist, but they instigate him, they get him to go. It it has to be one of those two things at this point because it's so automatic. It's so obvious. The moment you get under that guy's skin, he turns into a cyborg. He can go from he was completely not in that match. And the moment that happened, he he completely like, obliterated that uh pop right in that set it just happens like clockwork as long as people hate that guy like there's not one athlete that i can think of and there's a ton that do this but he does it the best there's not one athlete in the world who um uses weaponizes hate to their advantage like novak Djokovic does no one like yeah. as long as people hate that guy in the crowd and want him to lose as much as they do for the last 20 years or whatever, 15 years he will win slams. That's when he retires, when people start to like him too much. <laughs> the greats find a way to get their motivation. His is, as you said, as you put it perfectly, he tries to weaponize hate and he doesn't. And look, I think he is well liked. And I think a lot of the fans in that match loved it. So I'm, I'm with you, but maybe there is a conspiracy theory there. And I get getting behind your guy. And we all know a line that may or may not should be crossed. But at the end of the day, Popper used the crowd to his advantage, played well. Djokovic is at a point now where he's handled business. It hasn't been as crisp as he'd like. He has Echeverry next and maybe a showdown with Ben Shelton. So I think we're in the same boat, right? We're going to expect him to raise his level and master this two-week process. But the only caution I would say, Hubs, is this is an aging athlete. As great as he's looked, eventually right there will be a cliff. So where that is, who knows? It could be round four. It could be the final. It could be three years from now. I'm not doubting him until he says goodbye. And then I'm not doubting it even then until he's gone for a year. Cause I could see him just being like, I can still beat these guys. He's watching on TV, but um, sure. Yeah. At some point, father time hits. It, he keeps track of his, he keeps, you know, his body like a temple. Yeah. Like he, uh, he is going to preserve himself the best possible way. Sure. He's wiping his nose. He's got a cold. That ain't get, he, I don't care about Novak Djokovic's cold. Like, he, he's fine. Like, that's not going to derail his chances of winning the Aussie Open. Yeah, the wrist thing, that could be an issue. With, you know, that, that's a little ongoing situation here. I'll say this, and we, I'm sure we're going to get to him, but the way that Demon Hour beat him, the way that Demon looked against him at the United Cup was a little bit of a whoa. And I didn't know how to take it as more of this is Novak really just going through the motions here of warming up for the Aussie, or has Demon really turned the corner here? Because he looks awesome. I think he like has. There's something going on there. There's you can see, and also a mental. You know, not necessarily that Novak has owned him. Like I think they barely. That was maybe their third career head to head or, or second or whatever. But Demon struggles in these big matches against big people. He always crumbles to get that mental block. Like that's not there anymore. Like, you you can now go back in a moment when you're in a slam or a one thousand, and he's in trouble or he's you know neck and neck with it with a big player. He can now dial back to that United Cup moment of like. I've beaten Novak Djokovic in straight sets with the crowd going nuts and the people caring. So, like, that's big for – I don't know. I think I'm taking more of that side than Novak, yeah. you know, just, like, out of sorts or whatever. He's probably – doesn't care a whole lot about the United Cup. But um, but Echeverry, he'll blow out. Um, and then Shelton will be fun. And, you know, the, the media is trying to really 
you know, bring back this U.S. Open controversy that Ben Shelton, to his credit, wants nothing to do with. Um, uh-huh. And I haven't really heard of his dad since the U.S. Open, which is a good thing because I think his dad was getting a little too much. I'm sure he would, on the side, agree agree with that. Um, but, yeah, Ben doesn't want any part of this. Like He's just like, yo, we're at the Aussie Open. What are we doing here? That was yeah. last year. That was last fall. So um, I think the whole, you know, that would be the first real, like, popcorn match, mm-hmm. um, like, true popcorn match. I guess there's Korda Rublev is coming up. Oh, at- I would- Maybe tonight's match, though, but as we record this, because I don't know, it's it's a level down, but Draper and Tommy Paul is yeah. what I would consider a pretty sure. good pop. That, that's more for us, I feel like, then. Uh, like, but, like, people well, will see Shelton Djokovic be like, okay, yeah. here I, we go. I think Demon Hour from that side, it's it's fascinating, too. It's also what you do. There's the letdown spot. We talked about it with just the other day here at, with women's tennis, right? Garcia beats Osaka, emotional match, loses her next match. Demon Hour keeping it going, playing Arnaldi yesterday, who is a tricky opponent, losing six games. Demon Hour has been trying to get to that top 10 level. He finally cracked it. He has a lot of, you know, he's one of the fastest players on tour. And you think that maybe, you know, players do lose matches in Djokovic's sense. Like there's no perfect season in tennis. So I'll give credit as Djokovic did to the player in Demon Hour. The Shelton side was interesting too, because he played in Aussie yesterday, Hubs. Mm-hmm. And in that match, he had to raise his level. He had to find, and I don't even want to say it this way, but it's the only way I could think, like find his emotions. He was a little low in that match early. O'Connell started, O'Connell started playing pretty well, and then suddenly he had to, he had no other choice to raise his emotions. So I wonder with Shelton, you know the focus is going to be there when he plays the best, if this is a pattern to watch, making sure he's emotionally invested in these matches against the quote-unquote lower-ranked lesser opponents. Yeah, and I mean, that was the issue last year in non-slams, right? He was, he was yeah. miserable in the summer. Like, he, that U.S. Open run seemingly came out of nowhere with – the results he was showing at all these lower events because he couldn't kind of get up for it and keep that consistency going does seem like he's turning he's turned a corner in that sense and he's mm-hmm. he's he he looked very good I felt like in the warm ups to to the Aussie so um yeah no uh that's always I feel like that's that's across all sports though is the letdown game you know like yeah. just not taking your opponent too seriously and just you know the catching off guard and be and and you know the guy who's really impenetrable to that is Djokovic because he'll just realize, oh, I'm a set away from losing. I'll try now. Okay, no well, problem. We were spoiled by the big three, right? Because those guys, and even Murray, yeah. too, to his credit, like they just got to every quarterfinal. So it's not normally like that. Um, that also said, there's not a, a quote-unquote guarantee that he's going to get there, too, because Manorino is a tricky opponent. I just want to circle that one because that's a 36-year-old now who's ranked higher than he's ever been in his life. And that is one where Shelton will have to be invested and engaged in i think he should hit up his uh his friend chris eubanks because he was the one guy that figured him out last year so i would just say manorino is one that's not going to give he keeps his racket strung so low he doesn't give you any power back and it's just a slog would be the way i would describe he it. he is the most frustrating i think athlete in all sports manorino like when you're when you're betting when you have a bet against him it's so fr- you have no idea what's happening you're just like why no. haven't we won all these points because he this guy's this guy he is an art i think he's i'm all, like when uh, I first got one of my really good buddies into tennis. We called him the broken arm man because he just plays like he, he holds everything like he has. Broken. Mm-hmm. He does have, I think, a long term arm injury. That he get. That's why he kind of plays like he does. It has some sort of effect. Anyways, he's played great over the last like 12, 16, whatever it is, 16 months. Uh, yeah. That is going to be tricky. I do like that. A, a gambling line for him was like minus 250. I think Sheldon, I think that's a respectful line. I, I was worried it was going to be a little lower. I think. He, I think he'll be able to handle himself there. Um, now, obviously, it is a look ahead for sure because you have no back. Yeah. You have no back. That is always dangerous in every sport. Um, yeah, I hope Ben gets through. It would be a real shame. I, no one wants to see Novak Djokovic against <laughs> Man- Manorino. Like, come on. Sorry. Don't you also think it's crazy we live in a world six months ago, even if we would ask this question, we live in a world where last night the feature match with other Americans playing was Ben Shelton. Like, Fritz is playing. No disrespect to him. High rank. Tiafo's going, didn't work out for him, but it's Ben Shelton on TV. And we all were like, yeah, no brainer, but that's just the star power and the ascent that he's had. Yeah. I, I think it has to do with his youth. Um, it has to do with the, the high, the high uh, mile power to serve the flashiness um, uh, and, and more of like the, the potential. I think everyone sees the potential here. Like we've seen everyone for a little bit here, all the Americans, you know, and they've kind of had their moment. They still do, of course, like Corda, Fritz, like absolutely. But yeah. the the meteoric rise of, of Ben Shelton is is notable. And, you know, ESPN is gobbling it up and they want you, 
you know, people want to see Ben Shelton. He's the highlight reel. Like he's the guy that obviously not to the level of like Carlos Alcaraz, but like he's going to make some, he's going to have some points, some winners that are going to be, I, you know, jaw dropping that you want to see. So yeah, to their credit, they get it. That is crazy though. Of course, like he is, this is, you know, we're two years into this, a year into this. So yeah, credit yeah. to him for figuring everything out. And, you know, you almost look at his ranking too. And it's like, how did he get this high this quickly? Winning, you know, going deep in the U.S. Yeah. Open certainly helped. Yeah, the consistency will get there, but we know the ceiling. It's a big, you know, it's a big ceiling talk with him. Fritz okay. has been the most consistent, but we see what happens every time he plays Djokovic. It hasn't gone his way. You think maybe Shelton can crack that. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out for Tiafo. I just want to say last night, though, watch most of that match. Uh, Matchock, or Matchock, however you pronounce his name, unreal player. Like, unreal match, at least. I'm excited to see where it goes for him because the kid's like 21, just kind of got to the main draw level yep. and was playing some old-school 80s-style tennis. Unfortunately for Tiafo, though, Hubs, it's another early-round exit in a slam and another setback for a player who has big goals in mind and unfortunately not able to hit them. Yeah, he unfortunately seems like, you know, that, that deep U.S. Open run he had is kind of it. I, I don't really know how much confidence they put in him at slams these days. Um, compared to the other in, Americans, in New York. Well, in New York, I mean, he made the quarters last year. Didn't go well in that match against, no. against uh, Shelton. But okay, I, I'm willing to put New York on an island. The yeah. other three, though, yeah, it hasn't. And I, I'm looking at the last, you know, last year's Grand Slams. It was the Hatch and Off match in Australia where he blew all those tiebreaker points and lost. He's very at the French Open, a winnable match. Dimitrov, I think Francis would tell you, was his worst match of the year over two days against Wimbledon, and then the Shelton match at the U.S. Open. So something is not clicking and it is a testament to your opponent but there are still those dips that are coming back in you know five ten minutes of uneven play at this level you know i mean you can't give an opening to even the 70th ranked player no. in the world no and yeah i i i, I did actually bet macaque i i did bet Tom, i i i had i thought i thought the line was really good um in, in the sense of that it was not very high for tiafo like there were there were red flags all over that match didn't expect it to go like that that way. Like he he showed nothing. So um he was flat the whole way. Yeah, and credit to 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 Tom. Like Thomas was flying. He was awesome. Uh so yeah, they're very young, uh talented guy that definitely could I feel like his ranking doesn't justify like what he's cooking yeah. right now. So good for him. Um but yeah, guys like Corda who's like seems like hopefully fully back from the injury at this point, you would you would hope. Um when he's playing with confidence I have him over Tiafo, yeah. no, no doubt. Um, he seems to – he's just got to figure out the mental side. Once he masters the mental side, once you know, it may take a few more years, but closing matches is, is probably Corda's biggest issue at this point. Like Everything else is there. Mm -hmm. um, Tommy Paul is kind of the consistency that you don't see from Tiafo. You know, I, I feel like it, it slams. Like Tommy's making run – like Tommy's getting there now. Tommy's pull, like stacking – pretty solid deep runs in these in these slams which is great to see we'll see what happens to draper tonight that will be obviously you know you're you'll, you when you're hearing this you know what happened unless the rain <laughs> never stops but um yeah. no that yeah. is a very interesting match for tommy i'm i'm very much rooting for him were you draper man and we, we talked about him just puking after beating marcos Garon. I, I like both these guys so i'm just hoping for a good match i think both these guys draper has a ceiling but his body had been letting him down it was good to see him win a fifth set but yeah jacking right away uh after i didn't actually ask you though u.s open speaking of tommy paul you know that thing with the fan having his lucky fan on the outer court will him in kind of showed you you know showed you the growth and maturity and just how he's handling his ascent pretty well but it was cool to see him hook up that little kid fan on the outside court that rallied and wooled him on he knows how to play to the masses i'll say that like that's a quick way to get everybody on your side you know having him courtside you know i need him at the next match and all that giving him those tickets Sick. I think even the kid at one point was getting better tickets than what Tommy was offering him. So yeah, good for good for that. Hopefully he's back. Uh, you know, later later this summer. But um, no, Tommy gets it, man. Tommy's cool. I think people really like his style and how how calm and collected he is. He's never he's the epitome of never gets too high, never gets too low, which is such yeah. a good way for an athlete, um, you know, a, a high level athlete to to be at. Like, and you know, that guy's demeanor, that guy is breathing. His heart is always just the same, same level. Good for him. Um, and yeah, he's getting better. The, the confidence coming to the net more like to see it. I hope, I hope he takes it to Draper tonight. Sorry, Jack. But, um, yeah, yeah I, 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 and I like his, I like his chances tonight. I really do. I think 
the way, the easiest way possible Tommy could have won, I feel like, besides like a walkover. Like he completely cooked and the complete opposite for Jack, who obviously has the fitness issues. Good mentally, I think, for him to get through that match and get through it, I guess, is in quotations because he puked his brain. You know, he could barely even shake hands before throwing up. Um, and he's so talented. I think in, at some point he's going to master that and figure it out. And it's going to take like two or three years. Now we're not there yet. Um, no. But hopefully Tommy's getting him at the right time. I think he's 0-2 head-to-head. He just lost to him, what, 10 days ago last week, how, whatever it was. Uh, should be a good match. Hopefully a popcorn match, first first real one. And, yeah. and it's not too late as long as the rain has stopped. <laughs> I haven't seen if it's stopped yet. But still, Yeah, still got some suspended graphics on my screen, Okay, uh, unfortunately. Uh, more with Barstool Hubs here on Tennis Channel Inside and talking 2024 U.S. Open. Want to bounce around to the women right now because you said lines that, you know, the one player, the one line didn't make a lot of sense, had to jump on it because it was too low, too uneven. There was nothing more true to that statement than the Andreva Jabor line yesterday. Oh, oh, I saw yeah. it in the morning and I saw Andreva as the favorite. We can put two and two together and see. Usually the odds makers know something. But Mira Andreva, my goodness, like what she did, what she's doing at this age, how she's getting better. I'll put it this way, Hubs, and I'll let you expand on it. Beating Jabor in thorough fashion, love in two, the number, you know, one of the highly seated players. She was somebody we all thought is going to be a Grand Slam champion in the, in the discussion for one of the best in the game within two to three years. And now I'm thinking that's too much of a long estimate. She's better than even I thought. We were heaping praise on her left and right. She seems like she's for real and she's here already. She is unbelievable. Uh, and I, I, she's got this like stoicism to her. Like she's, I mean, she's a little bit, she can lash out a little bit. You know, she's 16. It's understandable. You're allowed to do that. But she's got a lot of cocoa to her and like that, that vibe. There's a lot of cocoa golf there. Um, and she's terrifying and the way she handled Ons. And man, I, I feel for Ons. I want, An- I want Ons to succeed. I just don't know if it's there anymore. Like there is a mental, I, I can't believe like the off season didn't, this is just weird to see her this flat and this, and this off like right, right away. But yeah, she might not be able like, I don't know. She's going through a lot. She might need a little bit of a break here. There were two you know, distinct storylines slash things you're hearing. One being the Wimbledon loss you know, until she wins a major. If that never happens, yeah. I mean, that's something you don't get over this right. year. What happened? and then what that took out of her. The other thing is, I don't think she's fully healthy. I don't think she had the full proper offseason. You were talking about how ridiculously short the offseason is. Yeah. They played in that absurd WTA finals in Guadalajara in like October. True. And then you're already back at it already. I don't think she fully healed and uh, her level was a bit down. And we know it doesn't take much, especially at this level. And Dreva is someone that I expect to go in deep runs. There's certain areas of her game that she needs to improve, but youth on her side and what she can do she has she's a fun one draw as well like she's yeah. like she should she should destroy perry then you get krejcikova like her there um mm-hmm. krejcikova can be tricky you know with, with kind of being a backstop situation yep. there but i think andreva has got and then that sets up a little sabalenka <laughs> situation which could be you're in week two then and then it's you know once you're in week two anything can happen so yeah can we get sabalenka it's... sabalenka and driva would be cool like i would that's a that's a match you circle you stay up you ruin your next day for it. absolutely how, yeah how would you put the sabalenka like there's no one in women's tennis like her for a lot of reasons the power is unmatched she literally hits it as hard as the male players mm-hmm. it's crazy we know the temperament can be up and down she's been the most consistent major player in the sense for how deep she's gotten but she either wins it or, you know, in spectacular fashion loses it. But in Australia, Hubs, how do you see it going? Do you think the pressure might get to her because she's defending the title? Or is this a place of comfort given that she's won the major and knows she can do it here? I, I lean more that once you get over that mountain, it's so much easier to climb back to the Like, so much easier to get back there. If she was still chasing a title, a slam, like, way different situation. I, I think there's way less focus on her then. Like, yo. If, if she's still without a slam, that's a story that you're going to see. You know, she could be warming up in the gym or whatever, and you're going to see, is Sabalenka going to win? And then that gets in your head. You don't see that because she won. So, like, it, it's, I, don't, I think that pressure is gone, and I think that's mm-hmm. obviously going to benefit her big time. She's got an interesting match if she wins against uh, Serzenko because Bedoza has taken this layoff and looks – she's one of the more surprising players so far here. It's Paul Bedoza. I, I did not expect her to come back from the injury and look this good. And obviously, Anna Mazova is another yes, big. That, 
match matchup. And if any Smova Bedosa in the next round, not expected. Both players that have taken time off, been open about their mental struggles. Both have been either in Bedosa's case, ranked really high number two in the world, or any Samova, a Roland Garros semifinalist. She's still only 22, which is just absurd to think about. So, yeah, and, and hard hitters as well. I think Sabalenka's draw, though, the one thing I keep coming back to with her is that she seems to get through to that quarterfinal, semifinal round pretty handily. That's when the tests come, when she plays better players and can get to her game a little bit. But it's going to take a lot. It's either going to, like, Rabakina is the only one that can out hit her. Coco and Iga might be able to out strategize her and be more versatile. But it's hard when you're not, when you, when you can't have that elite level one or the other. It's just hard to get to her. I wonder, can we, Andreva, maybe, maybe, mm. be, well, did she, there's firepower there. And yeah. the way Adam Sova's hitting the ball, I don't know. Like, this is not a cakewalk for, like, Sabalenka had to look at this draw, and it, this is not supposed to be this this difficult to just even get to the, you know, quarters. So, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't see her getting to the finals. Like, I think she's going to slip up in one of these. It's just, there's a lot, lot of talent going at her right now. Did you put Coco in that same category of someone that's done it and now the weight's a little bit off? Yeah. Because I'll, I'll – yeah. Yeah. She hasn't looked say, she hasn't looked great, to be honest with you. Like there, there's mm -hmm. a few slow starts, but she's she has reached the point now where I think even if she gets broken early, like she like against an inferior opponent, she isn't like she's like, all right, I'll, I've done this before. I am I'm good now. So uh yeah, I mean winning the US Open that changes her whole life mentally, you know, and and, and all that comes with it with the, the fortunes and the fame. But um no, she she's reached the point now where Deep run should be automatic with her. Semi quarterfinals, semifinals, every single slam. I feel like you could talk me into saying, "Would you bet on Coco against every top player except for one?" And I'd probably say yes. But that's the thing. Like, if she has to play Iga in the final, we've seen how this goes nine out of ten times. Yeah, that. But even Sabalenka, Rabakina, Pagula, given what she's done and the growth she's shown, and you know the serves looked a little better, I think that there can be ways for her. You know, to I don't want to say comfortably, but have the hammer in those rivalries. But the Ega thing, and that's the beauty of tennis and styles making fights. Ega's got a problem of her own. Well, assuming she gets through this Collins match, she's in Ostapenko's section again. And Yelena just finds a way to just disrupt all of our future plans and brackets. She is. I, there's no words to describe that woman. She's just ridiculous in everything she does. And yeah, she is. She is kind of a sim similar situation of like Tommy Paula Carlos. Like, that doesn't make yeah. a whole lot. Like, why? Like, Tommy, I love Tommy. And, you know, he's, crack, he's knocking on the door of top 10 status here. That, that guy being Carlos's kryptonite is insane. But it's, it's like you said, styles make the fights. Yeah, Tommy can cover the court as well as just about anyone. I think that's the thing that Carlos isn't used to. No one that can run down, make him hit that one extra shot. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, if we get there. With Yelena, she, <laughs> Ostapenko just redlines. Yeah. Like, no, it's hard to She just spot. blacks out. She doesn't remember the match. Can't even tell her what, what shot she has. I won? Okay, cool. Great. She's shooting with the umpire. She's, she hates Hawkeye, all this stuff. You know, it's funny, too. She's playing tonight as we record this, Tamjanovich. And the last time they played in a major, <laughs> some sparks went down. So I wonder if, I don't know if it's too, I don't know if it's trappy necessarily because Tamjanovich's level hasn't been great. Pubs, but the fact is that the crowd's going to be against her. And <laughs> that could be something to monitor. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, you're not wrong. Um, but with Ostapenko, like, has there ever been one normal Ostapenko match? Like, tune in to Ostapenko match. Like, oh, yeah, that was straightforward. No problem. That doesn't happen. For all, the, for all the, you know, comments, jokes, and I'm cracking them as much as you are, but this is the best she's looked since she won that French Open in yeah. 2017. So we're talking seven years. She's back into the top ten. There's consistency and for sure that, that hasn't been there in a while. I've always just thought when we handicap this, obviously, Ega on the women's side has just, you know, been head and shoulders above, you know, on a consistency level. But Rabakina is someone that I thought some, in some weird way has floated under the radar, only as the one slam finished four in the world. And I watched that match against Pliskova, and I noticed a player that also shows zero emotions, like the opposite of Ostapenko and Sabalenka. But she fights in there. And, you know, it's little things like keeping your head in it that can give her that chance. So I would say Rabakina, I don't want to say necessarily I'm picking her to win the tournament, but she is somebody that has elevated herself into that what I call WTA big four level. Oh yeah, you see Rabakina on the other side of you, you get nervous. Like uh, like you, you were in for you're gonna need to play your absolute best game. Um, the way she serves like that, you can you can be having a good return game, but if she's having her ser her normal serve, that doesn't matter. Yeah, 
She's just going to ace you. She's going to win free points. And then she's eventually going to break you because your serve is probably not as good enough. Uh, so, yeah, she's an absolute danger and never someone you want to play. I, you know what? It's pretty open, man. Like, like, and by open, I mean, like, there are, you know, it's not just Iga and Saba. And I like that. Like, that is, uh-huh. that is refreshing. And there's, and there's younger, you know, there's not so much no-name players as well. Like, like I keep saying her name, but Andriva, like, and, you know, Animaso would be crazy, obviously, to, to win it right now. But, like, but, like. Andreeva is not? no yeah. like that is not an easy task whatsoever. You don't want to deal with that, and that's a, another thing. Is she's sixteen? She's too yeah. naive to know the situations going on here. Like she's just playing the next person. She's not thinking about winning a slam. She's, yeah. she's like, I'm just gonna annihilate you. Like that. She's <laughs> she she was they had her on the studio yesterday for the interview, and she's just so like she's very short, and obviously that you know she's young and she's nervous in that situation. But man, she she's this. There's like a cyborg to her. That is something you don't want to see when you're playing. So if I had to ask you across both tours, Hubs, who wins a quarterfinal first or if ever, Pagula or Rublev, you know, the O and eight streaks or whatever it is for both. And you had to, you know, bet, I don't want to say bet your life on it, but make a sizable wager first. <laughs> well, it's Rublev. It's just, if Novak's facing Rublev, and we don't like that's not something that, that's going to go well. This poor guy. Yeah. Uh, I would say Pagula. I because th- I, I think yeah. women's tennis in general is just more of a crapshoot, like in like than than men's. Like I, I, I feel like yeah, I would say Pagula. I would because if I know who Rublev can't beat and who he can beat, like I feel like on Pagula's best day, she can knock down anybody. I don't know if that's the case for Rublev. I think you. I think if Rublev is on his best, he still needs a top five player to really like to be, to be off a little bit. And I, I just think so. I want Rublev to win because he's like. I don't know. I, I don't like seeing Rublev sad. Rublev's sad face is depressing to see. And I see it too You much. said he was probably the most relatable person on tour, given how open he is about just how unbelievably frustrated this game yeah. makes him. Oh, my God. Anyone who hides their emotions in sports, spare me. Like, I, I, I love Tommy Paul, and I just said he doesn't get too high, too low. That ain't me. That's not normal people. We get mad. We throw shit. Like, we, we, we throw our arms in the air when someone hits an ace for the third time in a game. Like, I want to see that. So Rublev has that, and, yeah. and you know, I relate to that. He looked pretty good against Chris Eubanks in that match, getting the break each set, winning in straight set, 6-4 across the board, and, and looking uh, pretty reserved, too. Uh, he doesn't have to play Djokovic to win a quarterfinal match, but it would have to be Korda in the next match, followed by maybe Demonauer and Sinner. So that's, I don't want to say murderer's row, but that's that's earning your first quarterfinal win if it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Korda and Demonauer, even though we already praised Demonauer, Beatable, like certainly mm-hmm. by by a Rublev, you know who has the speed to handle that. But then you said center, and then as always, mm-hmm. is, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He's looked, I mean, there's something with him where something's clicked, and I hate to say it like that because he was top ten for a couple of years. But right there's a noticeable difference. It's not just beating Novak a couple of times, but he's put it together. He's winning efficient matches. He's raising his level. He's monitoring his body as well. Uh, something's clicked and it's probably not one big thing. It's probably just over time. He figured out exactly how to hit the right buttons and be what I would say, probably the number two favorite in this tournament. If we had to handicap it, I know he lost to him in Turin in you know, when it mattered the most, but Sinner beating Novak in the round Robin stage in that insane match that like, I remember mm-hmm. watching on my phone, walking home from work and, didn't even see cars coming because I was so locked into that match on my phone. But like winning that match with the with the the crowd behind you, your your boys behind you, that's something that can unlock another level for Sinner. And that's kind of something he was he was waiting for. And obviously he's beaten Carlos. And it does seem he seems to be when he plays Carlos, that is a complete coin flip. And almost, I would even say a little. I'd even give like a sixty forty edge to Sinner. He's got the edge. Yeah, yeah like he's got the edge. There's right there's a little kryptonite there with his game, and obviously his game is one of the best in the world. But winning that, um, winning that group stage match versus Djokovic was big time, uh, and, it was, and he seems to be huge. carrying it over. It was huge. He's like, if he beats Djokovic at the semis, oh and we're God. getting all the way down. If he beats Djokovic in the semis, I will pick him to beat. If it's Alcaraz or Medvedev, whoever, I think he is going to win a Grand Slam. That's the that that you know. feels like the safest guy to win their first Slam this year, right? Like, just it's gotta happen. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it feels, the, the other it feels like it's time. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Uh, wrapping up here with Barstool Hubs on Tennis Channel Inside in 2024 Australian Open uh, taking off and taking flight into the second round still. A lot to discuss and digest. He's got Cam Norrie in a battle right now. Casper Roots fighting. I faded Cam and- today, so I'm really hoping he doesn't pull off this five-set comeback that he's trying to do. <laughs> Hey, still a lot going. Yeah, yeah, we know that's happened. Still a lot of matches to be played, but look at Alex Mickelson up on Uriel Hecka in the third. Split sets one yeah, one. Good for, so. yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, about to win the third set, it looks like here. A guy who I stared at before, and I thought the number was too big, but I like how he's played lately, is Klein against Severov. Right now, like something's going on in that match, but you know, this is silly to talk about on a podcast because you guys all know the results while we're hearing this. But if Klein wins, I'm going to be mad yeah. about myself because I really wanted to take him to at least win a set, and I just forgot. Are there any other players we should get to? I have a few in mind I was going to jot down and discuss, but anybody else that's caught your eyes early? I'll rattle a off a player. few yeah. here. Um, disappointments. Shapo. I don't know <laughs> what the hell's happened, um, but that guy just refuses, I feel like, to listen to his coach. Um, the Baratini injury stuff is very sad. I I, it almost feels like we're nearing a retirement situation for him. I just don't think he can get his body right. And it's a shame because when he's going right, he's one of the f- most fun grass court players there are because he just absolutely blasted by you and, you know, ace his way to it to a semifinal or final. Um, Murray feels like this is it, uh, retiring. Uh, yeah. The way he said, like, he doesn't think he, you know, he didn't say that, but he said, like, he doesn't know if he's coming back to Australia. The way he said it feels like it's over, which is sad because. Murray in Australia made a lot of memories for, for me. Like, that guy has a laundry list of that. Um, Raonic, obviously, you know, same kind of deal as Berrettini. That kind of feels like it, despite the comeback. Um, but we mentioned pretty much everyone else here. Um, Adino Pris- Prismic, I don't know. I think that was, that was cool, yeah. man. And I've never really seen <laughs> Novak embrace someone like that. I feel like that's going to do wonders for his confidence. Um, and he did play great in that match. Like they were... And Novak saying he yeah. sees a lot of him. Like, Novak hasn't said the things – he hasn't said that kind of stuff to Carlos, I feel like, <laughs> that he said to Dino. And maybe that's just because Carlos, is, you know, you don't want to give him too much ammo here, and he probably thinks that. But right. the way he was praising Dino and the way he, he hugged him twice to the net, it was like, I was like what's mm-hmm. – whoa, okay. It, it took Alcaraz winning Wimbledon for Djokovic to really yeah. start heaping the praises. I think there might be something to the Balkan, Croatian, Serbian, like, you know, brotherhood maybe why he's there but it's true i mean the game was there and you hope this kid who won roland garris juniors last year keeps it going the other name i had down here we haven't talked about because he fought and looked a little better last night as that match went on with sitsipas there's been so much made about his injury his back his serve he went kind of back to the old serve and he was in a dog fight against an aussie a guy in jordan thompson who'd beaten him before and gives him a match but i was i guess pleasantly surprised that he was able to raise his level i wasn't sure he had it in him given the current form he was in yeah I agree. Uh, good, good for him to get the W. This doesn't last much longer. I don't think so. I, yeah. I don't think physically he's in a good spot. I feel like the change of the serve is to kind of prevent himself, like and, and kind of save himself uh, from an injury. I could easily see him losing to Van Ash in the next round. Well, that's that was another one on there because Van Ash, what he's been doing, and you know Arthur Fees has been the talk of young French tennis. Van Ash is kind of remarkable to me because not the biggest guy, obviously has insane cardio, outlasts these guys. The Musetti match, we were talking yesterday of matches to go see looking ahead before we knew. It was like day matches, court seven. Yeah, Musetti, Van Ash would be fun. And that turned into this five-set France versus Italy war that uh, kept going. And I think Van Ash could give Sitsipas a match. I also think Machac could give uh, Hatchinoff a match, who, who had to battle against Kovacevic to win that match. But Hatchinoff's an ultimate fighter, but I don't know. I don't know if his... This time of the year is tough because what's the level like going into these matches where, you know, the heat's also a factor? Yeah, I actually thought uh, Kovacevic was going to give Hatchinov a better – like, well, he did. I mean, he came out firing in that first set. Like, he, he was hitting behind him. He was being aggressive. His first serve was just not consistent enough. He did steal a set, uh, which was cool. But, yeah, uh, uh, Hatchinov is a little bit of, I don't know, in slams, hard courts. This this is like consistency to him there. Like, that, I'm like, okay, he can make a little run here. Um, with Van Ash, I actually felt I, I made the decision that I talked about earlier in the in the podcast of you know do I want to ruin my day or not. Fell asleep after the third set there. I bet Van Ash waking up to a bagel in the fifth was pretty cool. I'll say that that was so. I, Van Ash has a little bit of a check mark next to him for me. Whenever I see him, my light my eyes you know go up a little bit. Um, he I, he can definitely beat Stefanos with the way he looks. 
wrap this up with the uh, other side of the draw, the heavy hitters there where you haven't really spent much time on. Carlos Alcaraz looking like he's in better form. Medvedev has played one match, lost the set, but rallied, got a retirement. You know, you could throw in Holger Runa, who's always an adventure out on the court. And then the other candidate I throw in there, he's playing some of the best tennis of his life, is Grigor Dimitrov, outlasting Fusevic in a very physical match. But that group of four on the bottom side of the draw, you probably got to think a finalist is coming out of there. So how do you see that going? I hope it's not Grigor, and it's not because I don't love him, but man, he, uh, he just has zero chance to beat a Novak Djokovic. Like, he just, he just doesn't. I, 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 mm. he, he, he sometimes lucks his way, I feel like, into getting there. And credit to him for... He's he's been doing this for years now, like a long, long time, way longer. Than I feel like I thought like the this level. Um, I just don't think he has anything to, that Novak would get worried about whatsoever. Um, I hope it's Carlos because I always hope it's Carlos. Uh, Medvedev though has played obviously well. He's got the track record to do it. Holger as well, and Holger is a guy who doesn't fear Djokovic one bit. So that's a guy that I feel like Novak wouldn't want to deal with whatsoever. Um, but with Holger, God, I always worry about him cramping. I just I just don't know how much his body can hold up, but it's been better lately, I feel like. Uh, but, I, you know, early on, I feel like it just wasn't. Um, but, I mean, I'm taking chalk on the men's side, I, I think. Um, I, I just I, – I don't think – Carlos, huh? I don't think – You go Carlos? I'm a Carlos guy. I'm a, biased, I'm a biased Carlos man. What can I say? I think we could see Medvedev Joker again just because – and not just because Medvedev beat Carlos in, in the U.S. Open, but it does seem like – Medvedev's track record at Aussie is pretty good. Big time. He's had some brutal losses in the finals, but it's it's a tougher draw for Carlos than he would have hoped. Um, and I don't know. And that's yeah. Holger would be an interesting final too if he puts it together. He's someone that I don't think, you know, has the consistency, but when the A level game's going, he's as good as anyone not named Djokovic. Dude, I was at um Rune's first matchup with Djokovic at the US Open when he was a nobody. Like well, I'm not a nobody. Obviously, like he was he was talked about, but you know, he's playing Novak in the first round. He was nothing, and he he blew me away. Like, he, fit, he broke down physically in that match, but I, I remember being like, wow, that guy's something, and here we are. Like, he's really, really good. Now, you know, whether he can elevate his game to get to a, you know, a slam final and, and beat Novak Djokovic, it's a whole different world. Um, and I don't hate your take about Medvedev whatsoever, and I just, I don't want to, there's only so many, Slam finals with Carlos and Novak left. You know, I don't know how long. I just want as many as possible. So sorry for being greedy and just rooting for that because anytime those guys are on, I know that people who don't watch tennis are going to wake up and watch that match. And I want that because I want the sport to grow. So, you know, shame on me for rooting for Carlos Novak. It's chalk. I get it. No problem. But that's where we, that's the fireworks. Anytime, anything that's not Novak Carlos and we get really close to it and we're denied is a letdown. Just this. Nothing wrong with rooting for uh, the dream matchup, but the beauty of this sport is you never know. You just never know. You could see Ben Shelton crash the party. You could see Sinner break through, Medvedev and Olger. A lot of options. Uh, Eric Hubs, Barstool Hubs, thanks for, thank you for joining this show uh, yet again. Breaking down the Australian Open. Best of luck with everything. Staying up all night if you so choose and your uh, Draper Paul action as well. But And Cam Norrie too. Can't forget about yeah. you know rooting against him in this one. But Always a pleasure talking tennis with you. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. See you soon.